trying to suggest to you all that you could uh, bring it up on your computer. Uh, it is John Singer Sargent's portrait of William Butler Yeats, the poet. So it's, if you just put in Sargent portrait of Yeats, Y-E-A-T-S, I'm thinking it will probably come up. And that way you can see maybe more closely by zooming in and out on your uh, screen, um, what I'm working on and uh, uh, we'll leave this up of course, but just a thought that you might wanna do that to be able to see the image I'm working from more carefully. So I chose this drawing of Sargent's uh, because it is a very vigorous drawing. And in that way, I think it shows the students that a drawing doesn't have to be uh, very refined or polished and finished to be an effective and um, yeah, effective portrait. Okay, so let's get down to it because we don't have a lot of time. I'm going to pull this in closer so you all can see. And what we're going to do here. Okay, that's pretty good. What we're going to do is to uh, use this drawing to focus on a couple of issues that are important in getting a likeness and in uh, portraits in general, and they are head structure and uh, light and shadow. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is to place the head and shoulders in my sheet of paper, my rectangle. And I do that very loosely. This is not a contour drawing. This is just placing where things will be described once we get to the description mode of the drawing. All right, so I just kind of rough it in like that with my charcoal. I'm using a soft vine charcoal. Excuse me, I have nothing on my screen. Um, I would recommend that you uh, try to log in and log out again. Okay. Um, that seems like an issue on your on your end. So maybe trying to log in again would would, would help. Okay. Okay, so once I've gotten this very generalized placement of the head, as I said, I'm not trying to describe the contours. I always describe, I always say this, this step is just showing me where the description is going to take place. It has not happened yet. So once I get these outer parameters of placement, I can, and they are specific to the drawing that I'm doing. So I'm not doing generic shapes, I'm doing shapes that are specific to the likeness uh, of my model, as we would call it. Um, and the next thing I'm going to do within this is to find the placement of the features, which is what I meant when I was saying the structure of the head. So the first feature I wanna find is the axis of the eyes that, that um, axis that, just, that runs from the far left corner of one eye to the far right corner of the other. And I wanna run right through the corners of the eyes. And this is tricky because I don't have uh, a lot of structure to place into. Okay, so that's placement. Again, it's where description is going to happen. The next feature I wanna place is the underside of the nose. And I want that to be exactly as wide as I see that feature to be, no wider, no narrower. I see it's gotta be off to the left here. Okay, so we got eyes, nose, and then the next feature I want to place is the division of the lips. It's 
So I find that division of the lips and I'm also going to place a little bit of that shadow under the lower lip. So you see that I am, again, doing nothing more than making indications of where description is going to take place that has not happened yet. The next feature after we go eyes, nose, mouth, we're going back up and get the structure of the eyebrows, the placement of those brows. Okay, we got the placement of the brows. Um, and then the next thing we want to, uh, now we're gonna go to the eyes. And when I go into the eyes, I will be for the first time uh, breaking into description, no longer working with just placement. So I'm gonna start with this right eye. and just start to shade in that iris. Get a little bit of that crease of the lid, but I don't have to worry about too much of that because that eye is going to end up in shadow anyway. And in that regard, I'm going to just nominally indicate the eye on the left because it will be very much in shadow. Okay, now I can take away that indicator that I created to show me where the axis of the eyes was. Um, and now I can go back to some of my outer description of the head. And in doing so, I am looking for some moments of dramatic contrast like that dark in the ear. And some of this jawline. And the neck, whoops, on this right side. Okay, now, so I said that the things that we would be uh, paying careful attention to in this demonstration were structure and light and shadow. So I've gotten some structure in terms of where the features are going to be described. And now I'm going to go to the pattern of light and shadow, which is in a sense also structure because it's the structure of the head as revealed by the light and shadow. So what I'm gonna do is just find that dramatic moment of the shadow running down that center of the face. And I am pretty quickly, immediately in fact, going to begin shading. And I go right through that eye that I created, that's okay.
So let me do just a couple more strokes here and then I'm gonna tell you what I did and why I did it. Okay, so we're at a kind of pausing point. So what I have done here is to uh, go through and shave. Now, when we shave with the charcoal or shave in any, with any utensil, what I am thinking of are accomplishing two things. I want to show the complexion of my subject. That's the, the complexion is the hair color, the skin color, and the eye color. And I want to show the direction and the nature of the light. So that when I'm shading, I have very specific objectives in mind. Again, describing the complexion of the model and describing the direction of the light source and the nature of that light source. In other words, is it a very bright light? Is it a gentle ambient light and the direction of it? Is it falling downward? Is it coming straight across? Is it coming upward? Okay, so that you can see that what I have done here uh, in the beginning is to begin to acknowledge both of those subjects, the direction of the light and his complexion. So that I would say if we had to stop right now and look at uh, the demonstration, there is some indication that this is a, a man with um, uh, fair skin, darkish hair, and perhaps darkish eyes. And we can see that he's in a light source that gives him a kind of even uh, balance between light and shadow, what we might call a half moon sort of lighting effect. Okay? Now, so the other reason that this uh, example of the Sargent portrait of Yates is a very good one uh, that I like to use with students for demonstration is because it very well uh, shows the, um, the two modes of description that we have at our disposal, which are shading and lines. So the first thing I've done is to make use of that uh, resource of shading, that mode of description, which is darkening to get complexion where there are darks in his hair and uh, direction of light by showing the, the difference between light and shadow. But if you look back and forth between my demonstration and the original, you can see how now I can go back and as I reinforce the shadow, I can also make use of lines to give a beautiful complement to those areas of shading, to give a kind of punctuation and um, uh, crystallization, I guess you might say, to these, um, the, 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 the various parts of the portrait. For example, if you look at the bow tie, you know, all I've done is just basically create a general shaded area. And we can see how looking at the original, there are wonderful opportunities still left to me to go back and be vigorously descriptive with a line. Now, one thing I wanna do is to even out my shading with a paper towel here. I'm just going to soften that a bit. And that brings it back to a kind of suggestive mode to which I can go back in again with vigor. All right, so where to start? I'm actually going to start out here in some of this darkest hair. 
And what you want to notice is as I put in these new darks, how the darks I had take on a more specific uh, complexion, so to speak, a specific nature. Then I'm going to come up here and start to shade in the complexion of the hair. Now I'm looking for linear opportunities, as I said as well. So there's one that gets that loose piece of hair, and then there's one right there, and then there's one that kind of goes around the ear. And we see that Sargent is really taking advantage of these opportunities to be very expressive with his use of the charcoal, to really press hard and express a kind of energy and exuberance he has for the process of drawing and the opportunity to make a portrait. Okay, I get my shading. You saw that I got this linear moment around the edge of the nose. There's one in there. Now we can come in. And start to be more emphatic about the division of the lips. And where I am first developing my shadow is where it is interacting with the light. So I don't want to be working on the shadow to the far left so much. I want to show it where it first meets the light. So the light's coming from our right to our left. And it's, it's that first moment to the far right where the shadow begins that I'm wanting to acknowledge it and see its presence. Now I want to go back to some of these really exuberant, emphatic line qualities that Sargent is giving himself. Okay. And there's some line qualities over here, which start to articulate the hair. And here. Okay, now I want to be definitive about the drama of that left side of the head. So I go ahead and use that dramatic line on the left. And I can come down in here and find that light that, that shows the collar of the shirt a bit. That was a little reckless. Okay, see how those dark indications give a kind of um, mysterious effect to the shadows where I had wiped them before. Let's come in here and start to shape that tie a bit. Now I wanna be careful with these linear moments that I'm referring to, not to start outlining everything because that's not what's happening in the original. These lines are being used very judiciously as complements to the shading, not as a mode of outlining the shading, okay? They are articulating the otherwise softer moments of the shading. Okay, then I wanna distinguish the shirt from the jacket. 
And I want to distinguish the shirt from the jacket because the shirt and the jacket have a different complexion from each other. The jacket is darker. Just like I want to show complexion in the head itself. Let me get that. Okay, see how as I find these various darks, the work I did on the head starts to, by extension, feel a little bit more specific in terms of the nature of the darks there, how dark or not they are. And sometimes as I'm working here, I am making an effort to create the context for the line quality with shadow first. So for example, in this left side of his jacket, on both sides of the lapel there, there is, there is, there are strong lines, but they reside in a kind of context of dark. So I create that context of the dark. And I'm thinking, let me do a little bit on this side, and then I'm gonna go back and finish the point I started to make. Okay, we get that. I'm going to That was not well done. I want to find a broader edge here. There we go. Okay, what I was starting to say was in the jacket here, there are moments for dark opportunity, but tell you what, before I do what I have planned there, let me come back and once again, kind of just look to soften the effect. I'm going to do it here as well. All right. Could be worse, huh? All right. Now, I feel like after uh, visiting all of those, uh, all the, every part of the portrait twice, I'm ready to now start to look to finalize some of this description. Okay, so one of the things I, what I'm going after now with my charcoal are moments of greatest contrast. So when I look at the head, the, 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 um, the shadowed area of the hair on his left temple there against that light background, that's good stuff that really allows me uh, several things. It allows me to use the charcoal vigorously. It allows me to get the complexion of his hair. And it allows me to uh, show the way that his hair is dramatically in shadow against that light background. And that moment of drama is, um, is very much a part of the portrait's overall expressive nature.
and is an expression as much of the artist, Sargent, as it is of the poet, Yeats. Okay, good. So we get that opportunity to dig in there. Now we got to come back here and start to be a little more definitive about some of the features in the head, which when I first did them, did not yet have the shadowed context uh, to be described within yet. Now they do. Have to get that underside of the nose shadowed there. But you can see perhaps now what I meant about this being a drawing that's good for students. Uh, you can really kind of tear into it. You know, it's almost like modeling clay or sculpting something with a big chisel. You can be, uh, you can achieve a lot with some rather simple means. And there's almost an opportunity for a line here in the chin. And then there's a couple zaps there in the Adam's apple looks like I made my neck way too short. We're going to have to live with it. You know, I got my, my uh, collar confused with the um, this is the top of the shirt here. <laughs> Let's see if we can move it. The trick with these zoom demonstrations is that I have to be at kind of an oblique angle to the drawing that I'm making. <laughs> and that's my excuse and I'm sticking with it. Okay. Well, let's move that tie down which is actually a fun opportunity to once again dig in vigorously with my dark, dark charcoal. Okay. So let's see how we're doing here. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to erase this neck a little bit. Uh, I'm going to go ahead with my. Distinguishing the features. So we did a little bit of that eyebrow on our left, and there is opportunity to deepen some of these shadows on the left. And we see that when the darkest shadows become more pronounced, it also affects the shadows that are not as dark because they're uh, 
their nature of being less emphatic becomes clearer. Okay, let's come back in here and see some of the vigor used in the hair overhanging the brow. I keep wanting to go back and oops, make use of Sargent's linear moment on the bony structure in the nose there. Then we can go back to that shading in the ear. And restate that jawline, but I want to be careful to not make it too heavy. And what you see with the jawline, you sort of see with some of the other uh, darks that I've emphasized, which is that when I put in these darkest darks, they tend to affect the light mass and make it seem to feel brighter. So the more emphatic I get about my description of the darks and the shadows, uh, the darks of the hair and the shadows on the left side of the head and wherever they are, that they, they tend to present this light as ever brighter. I want to go back to that eyebrow. I'll try this other piece of charcoal here. All right, so I feel like now I also want to be more specific about hair. And it's fun because it's a matter of just continually revisiting emphatic darks. And being allowed full opportunity to just kind of raise cane on it. Oopsie. So now I am looking for those opportunities for punctuation. And now I'm going back to what I started to say several minutes ago, which was that I wanted to create that soft shadowy context within the, um, the area of the left half of the chest and the bow tie, create the shaded, the shadowed context, which I could then build 
linear moments into, and I even, even though I've done a lot of that dark context, I want to do more before I uh, you know, put the icing on the cake here with those final linear emphases. Okay, how are we doing time-wise here? I got a couple minutes. All right. Pull out a little bit more back here. Now, when I am working on the um, the front, the, the, these dramatic darks in the center of the chest there, occasionally I am glancing back up at the head to see what the effect of these deep darks is on the complexion of the head, because they will alter the way it's understood, because now I have made the polarities of the darkest darks down here. So what's happening here is darker than the darks in the hair, and that makes the darks in the hair have a specific complexion of seeming to be a little less dark. So when we look at this drawing, we can kind of tell this guy does not have black hair. He certainly does not have blonde hair, but also he does not have hair darker than what it is, which is, looks to be a kind of darkish brown, but not black. And that's what I meant in the uh, beginning when I said my objective is to be specific about the description of both the complexion of the subject and the nature of the light. And I think we've gotten pretty specific about the nature of the light. And by doing so, we have described the very specific context that we see this head within. And so that outside of the picture, the light source which exists outside of uh, what we're seeing here, becomes by extension a part of our subject matter. Okay, so I think we have gotten our man mostly the problem is it could always be better and so we get up tomorrow and try again okay so we're at 11 15. i'm going to uh ask vita about questions that may have come in yeah um thank you so much paul that was fantastic um 
One question that I have for Maxine is, would you approach a portrait differently if you were working from life? No, I would not. This is done exactly the same, the same process I would do from life. I would place the head and shoulders as I did. I would get the placement of the features through those structural axes that I created. And then the first description I would take was into the direction of the gaze, the eyes. And then once I did that, I would start describing everything. And my, my entire um, mode of operation is to achieve the complexion of the sitter and the nature and the direction of the light. And when I, when I look at it from those two points of view, how to do um, what I need and when to do it is, is, um, is, is established through that, through trying to achieve complexion and direction of light. Wonderful. Um, any other questions you guys have for Paul before we go on? So Paul, you're, you have kind of a system in, in place, it seems like to me, for approaching a portrait. Yes, I have a process, absolutely. Um, and that is to uh, be making that effort, as I described, to likeness is a matter of structure, of the relationship of those features to each other um, and to the overall scale of the head. And I, when in class, I usually have the students practice that many times. We have the model take a different pose every five minutes. And we just do that first five minutes of, of structural development just to show the students how when you achieve that, you are uh, on a very uh, clear path to getting and maintaining a likeness. Mm -hmm. So the process I have is, is, is that way each time. And the good thing is that that works as um, a kind of logical way of approaching the various relationships of the head. So first you have, of course, the overall head, and that placement would be different if the model had a different hairstyle, or if you turned in profile, the head would be a different shape. Um, it is a process, uh, a means of analysis, let me call it that. It's a means of analysis that allows for any portrait subject to be of the two to allow me to approach any portrait subject confidently that this mode of analysis will get me there that i don't have to worry that oh no they've got glasses or oh no they've got um a receding hairline or they're balding or they've got a beard or they've got you know who knows what no matter what if i analyze in terms of structure complexion and direction of light um i'm confident i'm going to get that likeness uh, there's another question from Val. Uh, you use just one piece of charcoal. Um, do you need different weights and darknesses? Uh, I, I used only one um, hardness of charcoal, which was soft. If I was doing these on a regular basis, I would probably experiment with different hardnesses. Uh, I don't do them often enough. I usually just paint. So, the, so my drawings are demonstrations for students, for classes, things that I learned long ago. But I don't, as a regular basis, practice charcoal portraits. So, but if I did, I would imagine if you go online and look at John Singer Sargent's charcoal drawings, you'll see lots and lots and lots of them. He probably did dozens, if not hundreds of them. And I'm guessing that he probably used two or three hardnesses of charcoal, as well as other tools like a chamois and or a stump which would allow for blending and an eraser which i have not been able to discover lurking in my studio here um so that what is there this? would be a handful of tools what is a chamois a chamois is a piece of um it's some sort of animal hide but it's a very it's like a very very like a um sway piece of sway and what, what is, is it used what is it used for so I was using a paper towel at times to dust this. The chamois could do that. It also could, 
if used differently, more vigorously, it could actually remove the charcoal. Um, so it's a may, it's it's a way of kind of manipulating the charcoal once it's on once it's been applied to the surface. And a stump is a stump is a rolled piece of cardboard that is it's it's shaped like a pencil on the end of it, and they come in narrow and very wide. And that too, you could use like I was using. The difference between the stump and the chamois is the chamois would be a little bit absorbent. The stump would not. So if I went over this with a stump, it wouldn't lift any of the charcoal. It would leave it there. It would just um, soften that, that stroke like I was doing. Great. Cool. Um, so question about this charcoal picture, uh, which is a sketch, but how would you make it permanent? If you had finished the picture, um, how would you make the charcoal drawing permanent? You, I'm, I'm guessing the question is regards to fixative. Uh, there are various commercial fixatives that one could spray on, and I would do that because the charcoal is, um, is not, is delicate. And uh, if, and, presuming that it was going to be kept by someone, uh, you would want to frame it under glass soon, very soon. Gotcha. Because the charcoal is, is delicate. Yeah. Um, do you have any suggestions or hints or cheat sheets for figuring out proportions? So when you uh, first lay out the structure of the head, you're certainly thinking about how do the eyes relate to the nose, relate to the part of the mouth, to the chin, et cetera. Are there any guidelines or rules or cheat sheets that you use to make that um, measurement? There are. Um, so the one that I always make a point of, of, of uh, communicating to students and having them look for is that placement of the eyes. So as you saw, that's the first placement within the open shape of the head that I do. And students uh, always have a tendency to place that kind of high. And in fact, the eyes are about halfway between the chin and the top of this hair. You see how that's about true? This distance from the eyes to the bottom of the chin is about the same as from the uh, eyes to the top of the hair. His hair's a little bit taller perhaps or else I might be a little bit off. Um, but because when we're talking to people, we engage with the face, which is not the head, and the eyes are higher up in the face. But with the portrait, of course, we're drawing the entire head and the eyes are, uh, the rule of thumb is that the eyes are at the halfway point of the head which is the top of the hair to the chin. Uh, so that one I find extremely beneficial to know of and to expect to find. There may be heads where that's not true if somebody has a very full beard or some men have a very full jaw and they might have a receding hairline, maybe it would be different. But generally, even then, you can say, all right, well, here's an instance where that rule of thumb is different than um, the expectation that allows you the, um, to know about that and to use that observation uh, to get the likeness more specifically. Uh, once you have the eyes, I think placing the other features is, is much easier because you have that dominant feature to relate the nose and the, and the mouth to, and the eyebrows, of course. Um, and I always go in that same sequence from eyes to nose to mouth. It cannot be changed. I cannot start with the nose. I cannot start with the mouth. And so there is a logic to this um, in the sense that uh, there's an aesthetic logic or a structural logic to the head. The head is, I mean, rather, the feature of the eyes is the largest, uh, most significant feature, the dominant feature. Now, in terms of other rules of thumb, the one that I always thought was kind of interesting, I rarely make use of it, but that it is that you can divide the head into thirds. So from the hairline to the eyebrows is one third, from the eyebrows to the bottom of the nose is another third, 
and from the bottom of the nose to the chin is the third third, okay? Um, that, that's, you can use that, it's, it's maybe good to know about that. I, the only time I would use a measurement personally like that is if I could not get their likeness to save my life and I had to have some way of checking this and figuring out where the heck I was going wrong. But when I'm drawing, as long as the likeness is showing up, um, I think that measuring can be a little bit of a minefield uh, because when, you, when you've got a model who's, let's say, eight feet away from you, you know, all of a sudden their head gets kind of small. And if you start trying to measure, if you're off just a little bit, you might fool yourself about the relationships of those measurements. So when I'm teaching students portrait drawing and structure, I am definitely emphasizing that they first and foremost um, learn to train their eye to see these relationships as accurately as possible, as sensitively as possible. And I do say to students um, always that in drawing and in painting, sensitivity is much more important than accuracy. You can have a drawing that is inaccurate and it can be stunning if it is very sensitive. The opposite is not true. An accurate drawing that lacks sensitivity is, is of no particular impact. How do you define sensitivity? Sensitivity is, um, that's a good question. How do you put that into words? Sensitivity is love. <laughs> sensitivity is, is really, you know, when Sargent is drawing this, this guy, anybody he's painting or drawing, he loves that head. Doesn't mean he loves that person. It means he loves the beauty of eyes, noses, mouth, skin, hair, light, all this stuff together. He's just passionate about it. And there's a sensitivity to your materials. You know, you can use your materials. I could have drawn this whole thing and made it look like it was done with a magic marker if I pressed too hard. That would be insensitive. Sensitive is finding all these various ways to use the charcoal. And my sensitivity in my eye is seeing all the little subtle differences between the way one thing is described and another is described um, when I'm looking at my model. So that I could have everything in exactly the right place, exactly the right place, and still draw it without sensitivity. I could still draw it where the lines were not properly reacting to the beauty of the crease of an eyelid, or the flare of a nostril, or um, the edge of a shadow. Those things are beautiful in themselves to a sensitive artist to a sensitive person and when that's conveyed through a passion and a love for that thing itself um, that's special and I could do that an artist could do that and have the chin way too long or the eyes too far apart and it would still be beautiful it would still be an act of an expression of a profoundness a love that is not common that's great. I love that definition, Paul. That's fantastic. That's great. To me, it's, it, uh, as you're talking about it, it also feels like empathy in a way. Mm -hmm. um, that ability to sort of empathize with the shape or the tone or the texture of something. Um, yes. But anyway, so a question from Harriet. Uh, when she tries to do portraits, she finds it hard to capture a specific look of the person or the likeness. Any tips for capturing likeness? Well, as I say, the, uh, to me, likeness is about structure. So, um, unfortunately, there's no escaping hard work and discipline in terms of pursuing this. Uh, so, avail yourself of information and then lots of practice. Take classes at pleasure. <laughs> there you go. 
Of course. Well, it is 7.30. We are right on time. Uh, unless there are other questions, I'm going to say thank you so much, Paul. This was really fantastic. And I really enjoyed your descriptions of your process as well as the notions of uh, sensitivity. That was, that was a blast. Thank you. Great. I enjoyed it too. Good to be with everybody. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks for and coming. Thank you everyone for thank being you. here tonight, for joining us. Please join us this Thursday for another Fleischer from a Distance. We're going to be doing an art history oh. lecture on the art during a pandemic and looking at the history of art and architecture that arose during other pandemics in the past. So it should be a fascinating lecture. Um, do join us for that. Otherwise, have a great night. And thank you so much, Paul. Take care. Be safe, everyone. My pleasure. Bravo. Bye -bye. Thank Bravo. You. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thank you.